Northampton Board of Health um, meeting. Today is February 3rd, 2022. This meeting is being recorded. Um, tonight present, we have all of our board members, Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Dr. Laurent Levy, Dr. Cynthia Swopis, and myself, Dr. Joanne Levin. And we have um, our fabulous, uh, some of our fabulous um, Department of Health staff. We have Director Meredith O'Leary, our nurse Vivian Franklin, our Assistant Director Amy Hutchins, and our Clerk Kelly Constantine. Do we have anybody else from our staff? I think that's it for now. Um, so we'll start, before we open our business meeting, uh, we will start with public comment. Um, and as many of you know, um, <clears throat> our public comment session um, is a way for the public to um, uh, participate um, and have all of our board um, hear opinions. Uh, we ask you to keep your comments to two minutes. Um, and um, unfortunately, the way this is set up is that, so that we can get to a business meeting is that there's not a conversation. You really can um, give your opinion um, and then there will not be a conversation. And then when we're done with public comment, um, we will open the board meeting. Uh, but I wanna make sure everyone knows that whether you speak tonight or not, you are always welcome to give uh, your written comments um, through the Northampton Department of Health website. Um, and so we're happy to have your comments in whatever format you would like to send them. Yes, right. um, okay. Um, okay, um, so for public comment, I see Amy Kahlane. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, my name is Amy Kahlane. I'm the executive director of the Downtown Northampton Association. And my public comment is very brief, just to um, reiterate and encourage all of you that as you talk about the best practices thoughts for the uh, business community here in Northampton um, to please consider reaching out to that community um, using me as a resource and just tapping into their experience, learning what they have been through during this pandemic and letting them help you um, figure out how best to support them as they try and um, address COVID in the multitude of ways that you are encouraging them to do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else here for public comment? Um, I can't see you, so you'll have to wait, raise your electronic hand, which is in the reactions button. Um, give everybody a moment. Anybody else here for public comment? I don't see anyone else. Anybody? Um, okay, I think that will, thank you, Amy. That will close our public comment session. Um, and uh, would anyone like to make a motion to open our uh, Board of Health business meeting? Um, motion to open the meeting. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think so. We'll start with data updates. Vivian has some fabulous uh, data for us. And then I thought I would give us um, a little update on the, the national data that's come out in the last month. Um, take it away, Vivian. And you're muted. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so here we are uh, now, I think officially two years into this, um, I think this past Tuesday, the first was a two year anniversary since the first COVID-19 case was reported in Massachusetts. Um, and then we had our first co uh, confirmed case on March 16th of 2020. So um, here we are, we're definitely seeing a downward trend in our cases. Um, it seems to be going down just as fast as it rose up 
Um, and you can see that in the very right side of this graph. Um, I do have a little zoom in on our current trends. Um, I'm doing seven day uh, case reports just because it seems to be changing that quickly. Um, so in the past week, um, I did take into account a delay in reporting that we have. So in the, um, I am looking back to the 31st, um, but in the past week, uh, we had 150 new cases um, that were you know, reported to Maven that does not, as I always say, does not include home tests. So that's 150 new cases with an average um, of 21 cases per day, peak single day case count, um, and our seven day incidence rate is 72.64 case, uh, cases per day per 100,000 people. Um, with the Massachusetts seven day test positivity rate being 6%. And if you just compare that to a few weeks ago, um, that's a really striking difference where we had 520 new cases reported in a single week with an incidence rate of nearly 252 um, cases per day per 100,000 people and our Massachusetts test positivity rate was 21%. Any questions on this slide? No? Go ahead. Okay, so vaccination coverage has not really changed dramatically um, since we last spoke. Um, and I do always look at it by age group. I have it parsed out, um, fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated. And now we also have the individual with boosters per capita category as well. Um, so you can see that the Booster coverage is less than the fully vaccinated with the primary series coverage. Um, it's hard with the booster data, though, because the eligibility for boosters isn't just age dependent. It's also dependent on when you got your primary series. So it's hard for us to look at it and know um, how many people who are eligible for the booster who have not gotten their booster. Any questions on this slide? Vivian, is it fair to say that most of the five to 11 year olds are not eligible? I don't think any of them are eligible. I think you have to be 12 and older. Okay, and it's also not been time, but I, they're not approved yet. Right, that as well. They, many of them just became fully vaccinated um, about a month ago. So mm -hmm. um, they still have some time. So they are still considered up to date on their vaccines without getting the booster regardless. Um, and here we have our case distribution by age and vaccination status, um, beginning with January 1st, 2022. Um, so these are case numbers. These are case numbers. So what this is not telling us is, you know, the incidence of infection or the, um, yeah, the percentage of infection based on vaccination status. So we know that our fully vaccinated and our our fully vaccinated and our boosted population is larger than our unvaccinated population. So this data is pretty much as valuable as what you're looking at right here. It does not take those into account. So didn't we say last week is that it could be both related to vaccination status, but also with behavior? I seem to recall that because obviously it does show you the unvaccinated are getting more cases. But we were wondering whether there was a behavior effect. If I'm vaccinated, I'm also more careful. Yeah, there, there could be a, a behavior effect, but I will say we um, we definitely have had a number of breakthrough infections among mm -hmm. our fully vaccinated and our boosted population. So it's hard to know what behavior is, what the impact they're going to have is, because you again, like you don't know if you know, someone yeah. vaccinated is also going to be more careful because they're unvaccinated. So what I, I've been looking at is this young people, the teens and 20s and 30s seem to have a high number of unvaccinated cases and they are lower in vaccination rate. Is that true? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we postulated whether some of those were students who were away who didn't get counted appropriately, but still it seems like the teens, 20s and 30s. Do you want to go back to the... Um, vaccination rate, and I think it's that group that's the least vaccinated. Um, yeah, 16 to 29 year old. 
And that does include the college population um, mm -hmm. who, I mean, many universities are requiring vaccination, so. But if they're vaccinated out of state, they might not be caught by the data, that's all. They might, yeah, that's correct. And then um, if the address at which they were vaccinated was not in Northampton, that could play a role too. They could be reported, but. Oh, yeah. Northampton. Um, that wouldn't play as much of a role in the 16 to 19 year olds, I think though. I think it's more out of state. But this could be an interesting way to look at where our vaccination efforts could be focused. Um, anyway, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and this is just the Massachusetts data. Um, it says case rate. So I'm actually not sure of what their denominators were, how they got that, I was looking at it. So I'm mostly just looking at the bar graph. It's a very similar distribution um, with what we're seeing where the younger age groups are impacted the most by infections. And then it you know slopes downward as you get into older age groups. So we're seeing very similar trends here in Northampton to the rest of the state. That's all I'm trying to convey with this. So yeah, it, it probably sense? looks like, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no. Oh, it's the total number of cases. Okay. So it'd be about 30,000 total in two weeks. Yeah. It looks like case number is not right, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Cause there's, there's decimal points. I, I have a hard time believing mm. there's a fraction of a person that's getting sick. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> Maybe it's so again, I'm not sure if there's a nominator here for case rate, but um, you can still look at the overall trends. Um, Maybe it's per hundred thousand or something like that. Well, 30, 000, if you count all those numbers on the bars, you get 30, uh, roughly 30,000. Hmm. I don't know what that means. Okay. Um, and then here's our hospitalizations and deaths over time since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I think it's very interesting that our hospitalizations still go up pretty dramatically with each surge, but each subsequent surge has a less dramatic rise in deaths. And I, I mean, I think some of that's to, definitely to do with vaccinations. And then I would, I would um, suspect that some of it is also doing with the, to do with our more successful hospital treatments once they are hospitalized. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, Dr. Levin. Yeah, I just spoke with some of my colleagues to ask what they're what they're seeing, and um, I think Omicron is is clearly different from uh, previous waves, and um, the people who end up having long hospitalizations and complicated courses are generally unvaccinated, and the vaccinated population comes in and may be in for a few days and then leaves. It's really um, they're not the ones with the long complicated courses, and and they're not seeing as many people sort of in the ICU being put on ventilators and the people who are even um, not counting vaccination, it seems like the people who are really getting the sickest are the people who have are severely immunocompromised, um, you know, have cancer treatments or bone marrow transplants. I mean, really um, highly immune compromised people that, that wouldn't mount um, a good, um, response to vaccine or disease. Um, those are the ones who are having the hardest time, but definitely seems different from other waves. Any other questions or input? And again, Vivian, this slide is showing um, those who are in the hospital with COVID, not necessarily that they came to the hospital um, for COVID. For the most part in this graph, um, it's people who are there with COVID, like for COVID, I mean, um, I do check through and look at our records since we don't have too many records. I think we've had in the 20s, I think it's 23 hospitalizations in this current um, surge. But um, I do look through and look to see if they were recorded as a hospitalization for COVID or with COVID. Um, and I know the state's doing the same as well now. Um, they're doing incidental hospitalization, different like differentiating between if they were there with COVID or for COVID. And I actually wanted your input too, um, Dr. Levin, because what they're doing to mark the difference is if the person was treated with dexamethasone or not, um, which is interesting because I don't think that all of the patients that I've had that were really there for COVID required dexamethasone or were treated well, with dexamethasone. For people who are sick with COVID, for the most part, 
the reason they end up in the hospitals because they're short of breath um, and have pneumonia and all, all of those patients would get dexamethasone. Whereas people who are admitted incidentally who have COVID positive tests, but they actually came in for something else. Um, so they would have a different admitting diagnosis, but during their stay, if they become mildly symptomatic, they could get treated with remdesivir because it's approved for early treatment um, with mild symptoms, but they probably would not get dexamethasone. So that's not an unreasonable way to look at it. I guess admitting diagnosis is also all over the place. There's no formal way to do that. So, so it's not a bad way to do it. It's not totally accurate, but it could be terrible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then this, I just want to be clear with our data. We have pretty skewed data because we have such a vaccinated population and we also have a small sample size. So it's hard to look at our data and say that this is generalizable or a controlled study or anything like that. But um, this is just looking at our percent hospitalized and it's percent of cases. So percent of cases by vaccination status and age group. So um, hospitalized throughout the course of the pandemic between uh, beginning in March 2020. Um, so you can see the risk for hospitalization pretty predictably like increases with age. Um, this does not factor in comorbidities at all, but um, even with just age, it does um, trend upward as you increase in age. Um, and that's true if you are unvaccinated, if you have a primary series or if you are boosted, um, but your risk considerably goes downward um, based on what we're seeing in this data and then what they're seeing nationally. If you are prime, if you have the primary series and then especially so if you have the booster. So if I read this correctly, let's say I'm 65 and I am not vaccinated and I get COVID and what I see is the odds are 15% that I'll end up in the hospital. Is that what it's saying? No, I don't think so. I think this is a rate, um, is it Vivian or is it um, of all the people who are hospitalized with COVID, these are their status? It's percent hospitalized um, and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't factor in comorbidities or anything like that. I wouldn't, like it's, it's, not to say that if you became sick as somebody who's in their 60s that you're going to have a, like a 14% risk of. No, that's not what it is. It's not generalizable data, but this is just percent hospitalized in the Northampton population by age group and by vaccination status. It's not percent hospitalization, right? It's of all the people with COVID who are hospitalized, What's the yeah. breakdown in their age and vaccination yeah. status? The denominator is hospitalized with COVID, right? No, nope, the denominator is their age group and their vaccination status. Mm. So if I added all those bar, we get 100%, you're saying? No. What would I get? It's not a distribution. I mean, I, I see the word rate. and That's what I'm trying to understand is if it's a rate, What's on the numerator and what's on the denominator? The numerator is the number of people who, like, say, if we're looking at unvaccinated, it's the number of unvaccinated cases hospitalized over the number of unvaccinated cases in that age group. Okay, so in the population, my, not in, in the, the population. I have, I do have that data for us. So, what's the denominator again? The denominator is the number of unvaccinated cases in or the number of cases with their primary series or the number of cases with the oh cases compared to hospitalizations compared to cases yes well so is then therefore isn't it correct to say if i'm 65 and unvaccinated the odds of ending in the hospital is it's close to 15 percent well no because it's it, it's it's subject to other variables that aren't here well, on average, then. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm turning yeah. into a statistic into a probability, and you know? obviously, this, <laughs> there's a little bit of a shortcut. Mm -hmm. But I was just curious whether this is the way we could say is, it's. I mean, your risk is certainly higher. 
but the overall, I mean, the orange in the 70, the 70 year old group, I, as you pointed out, this orange bar is quite high. Yes, but it's such a small group of the population. It's um, so many more people are vaccinated, right? So that blue bar, it's probably not a whole lot, large number and absolute value because it's a large proportion of a small number because many people are vaccinated. It's not the it's not the vaccinated population that's the denominator. It's the people with COVID. Yeah, that's the denominator. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, but I do have with COVID. data for the population as well. Just not here. It's in a different slide. All right. no, I have and to think about this one too. I have to think about this longer than <laughs> right. I'm just saying I. We have an interesting sample size here, and then um, there's other variables that aren't present. But you're, you're again, I mean, as your age increases, the likelihood that you have other comorbidities also increases. So it's hard. So to this is this is from March 2020. Also, this is not recent Correct. data. Oh, okay. Still okay. funny looking. Okay, <laughs> it is funny looking. I, it's just mainly looking at our cases. I don't. I don't know if I would use it to predict risk, especially as different variants come through. Um, and then this is data for just the past two weeks, all vaccination statuses in Massachusetts. Um, it says the rate of admissions. Again, they don't make it clear what their. Um, denominator is or how they're presenting the rate. Um, but just you can see on the graph again that that risk for hospitalization always increases dramatically with your age. Um, but it's still present for lower age groups. It's not negligible. And this have a, has a rate of admissions but the last two weeks of 388. What on earth does that mean? That's the state. That's very confusing. Yeah. I just like it for the graphic, but. <laughs> I like the unknown category that's blank. <laughs> <laughs> no data on people without an age. Okay. It's a little okay. hard too. And this is very similar. It's our case fatalities again since March, 2020. And I think there's a lot more variables in this one than in the hospitalization one, including um, the different variants and including the different treatments that we have now um, and the vaccinations. But um, again, the risk for fatality with this does increase with age um, and it goes down with vaccination really dramatically. But still pretty tricky because it's since March 2020, as you say. So. Right. So it has a lot more variables than, um, I think there's a lot more variables involved with fatality than hospitalization. Okay. And same, uh, this is the state data. So this is in the last two weeks, deaths have been observed. Um, again, that risk for death does increase really dramatically with age still. Okay, so here we have infection rate and percent of population hospitalized for COVID-19. Um, this is for Massachusetts on top, and that's just breakthrough infections. So they don't differentiate with that data if they had the primary series or if they had the booster. Um, and neither does, well, actually our data does down below. And I've also made it clear what our population is for each vaccination status. Um, so 8.1% of our fully vaccinated Massachusetts residents have now had breakthrough infections. Um, that again, that does not differentiate between the primary series or the booster. 0.15% um, of the breakthrough infections have had to be hospitalized, and 0.4% of breakthrough infections have died. Um, and then down below, we have our population data. 
Um, so our, we have a 6% infection rate for our unvaccinated population and 0.1% have of that population now cases have ended up hospitalized. 2% um, of the population with the primary series has been infected and 0 0.03 have been hospitalized and 5% of our booster population has been infected um, with 0.05% of them hospitalized. Uh, Vivian, are the booster included in the denominator for primary series? The reason I ask is that then, then you have, uh, if you add the ends for both primary and booster, you get a population that's larger than Northampton. That's an interesting point. So I'm assuming the boosters, the booster have to be included in the primary series, but I don't know what that does to the case count. I asked Vivian to throw this in at the last minute, so. I, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just trying. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So we're just going to ignore that then. Okay. Yeah, because it, I would it, imagine it, then, yes, I would imagine then there, there are included in that data. Um, so I don't know if I could correct that by subtracting our booster from our primary series. And the case, the case count, count is it, it not included. The Sorry, go ahead. The case count appears to be reversed. The case count is lower, is half, almost half the for the unvaccinated as it is for the booster. Yeah, because so many people are vaccinated though. Yeah. yeah. That's that's we end up with really skewed data because so much of our population is vaccinated. It's three three hundred seventy three out of six thousand. So that's a big that's a big proportion, right, so which is you get your six percent. out of fourteen thousand. I, I, so I believe that 684 would be for people that basically have primarily done more or less half, it's, it seems to suggest half the population is boosted in Northampton. So it's, it's understandable that if, if there is some breakthrough, you would, so many people that are boosted would get it. But it ends up being a 5%. It's a 5% rate versus 6% for the other. I think we need to take another look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Vivian. Uh, that, that, I, I would expect that to be quite different. All right. That was a last minute addition on my request. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It, it, just trying to understand it. Yeah. Any other questions for Vivian? Oh, one more. Oh, um, and I know we're supposed to be talking about vaccination efforts tonight. Um, I can bring this back when that's on the agenda or... I don't know if Meredith wanted to. No, Liz, go ahead with it. Just we can do the vaccine update right now. Sure. Since you're, since you're on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, Northampton Health Department has um, regionalized vaccination efforts since pretty much the dawn of our vaccination efforts, um, beginning with first responders and then outward to the general population. Um, to date, the Northampton Health Department has given a total of 43,031 doses, um, 20,021 first doses. That includes the primary series with the single dose J&J, &J, um, 15,737 second doses, and 7,273 third dose or booster doses. Um, so third dose being for individuals who are immunocompromised um, with a different eligibility schedule than for the booster dose. So in regards to um, the vaccine clinic, we have the clinic, our primary clinic that's at the Elks. We run it three days a week. About uh, starting last Monday, we went from having all, full clinics, all appointments, you know, filled to having barely any appointments filled. So we were really trying to think creatively on what to do last minute to get people through the door. So we um, ended up doing um, no appointments necessary. And we did a huge press release around that, that you could just show up anytime that we're open to get your, to get your booster um, or actually any vaccine. Um, we still are offering all three, even though the CDC and MDPH um, highly recommend either one of the mRNAs, um, but we still have all three. And we're thinking, you know, we've been brainstorming on, you know, 
where are we going to put our vaccination efforts moving forward? What should the focus be and how should we really get it out there? So I know Kate has been really doing boots on the ground work. She went out and flyered any place that had a bulletin board. Um, she's going on the radio tomorrow morning doing an interview. Um, we're putting electronic boards out. We are doing press releases, robo calls. We are going to do work with the businesses because when we when our vaccine efforts went from full speed ahead to dropped off to virtually nothing last June, we thought, you know, we we're thinking about how could we really get out there and it was a little easier because it was summer and we could do pop ups everywhere and we just can't do that right now. But one of the places that we really had a very good response to were the businesses. So we're going to, you know, blanket the businesses. Uh, Kate's willing to go out there with a backpack and her cooler and and give doses one by one. We really feel at this point, you know, any dose that we can get in is a win. Um, so it's going to be really incremental, but at least we're still out there. Um, and then our regional clinics that we're doing outside of the Elks in the Hill Towns and other communities, we're also going to make them walk in and uh, work with other agencies to see if we can get those people that just might not have had access or whatever the reason being um, in the door. And then the other thing that we're going to do is I really asked Kate to put some thought into um, some type of vaccine campaign. I don't want to necessarily use what the CDC is using or MDPH, but we'll use that as a starting point. And I really want it to be culturally sensitive to our populations. Don't know what that looks like yet. So to be determined, but that's where we're gonna be putting our focus in the next couple of days or week. Sounds great. Um, Mer Meredith, this is mm -hmm. this, uh, the pop-up aspect of, with no appointments is huge and wonderful. And um, just anecdotally, I was at CVS and they have this big sign, appointments only, right? Or no tests or appointments, appointments. And there was a frustration by a couple of people. And um, I just don't, I, I think our outreach effort has been great but some people just don't do the internet and that appointment thing is so cumbersome. Yeah. And, and so does the, do the physician offices and the, the uh, pharmacies in town know about this? So that we they did, we actually went to the pharmacies too to let them know about it, but that's kind of like a, a competition in their yeah. eyes because they really yeah. don't want to promote our efforts, unfortunately. But yeah, we did go there and we are going to be letting the um, the physician groups know about it also. We've Good. also, um, you know, asked Marie to put out a notice to um, the senior center members. We've done a robocall to every citizen in Northampton. I'm asking other communities to do the same thing. Um, reached out to neighbors working with neighbors. Um, yeah, so those people that don't necessarily use the internet a lot or have access, we're trying to reach them creatively. Great. Mer yeah. Meredith, do you know if um, Kate sends those announcements to the city councilors? Because every city councilor has a sort of an email list of, in, from their neighborhood. Well, so the press, anything that I do press related goes to the city councilors. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. It does get there. Great. Any questions for Vivian or Meredith on about vaccination? All right. I if I can share my screen, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to share some of the latest um, national data. Let's see. I can do this. Oh, I think I can. Can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Woo! Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is just, this is the CDC data about which variant is predominant. And this is in part to answer some of the questions that we had a few meetings ago about what do we know about Omicron? It seems like everybody is having a breakthrough infection and like, what is the data about vaccines and Omicron? Um, so as you can see, the purple is Omicron. Um, and we're now thought to be, you know, 99.9% .9 Omicron. This is national data. 
And we made the switch to Omicron predominance somewhere around Christmas. Um, so if you look at data, if you're counting sort of January and forward, that's mostly Omicron data. Um, so this is, um, there were several articles that came out at the end of January from the CDC. Um, and here they were looking at incidents, which means a positive test and death rates and comparing unvaccinated, what they call fully vaccinated, which is really not the most up-to-date term. It's a primary series I think is more appropriate. Um, and then with or without boosters. And you see their time frame is April 4th to December 25th. Um, so April 4th is before Delta. Delta came in around June. We had our peak around August. And December 25th is just the very beginning of Omicron. So we don't have a lot of data here from Omicron. Um, but um, these uh, uh, graphs are pretty impressive. So the, um, the background, the white is pre-Delta, the light blue is sort of the Delta era, and the gray is Omicron era. There's not a lot of data here. Um, and they looks like they're starting their Omicron data early December, but really was probably later than that. Um, and this first graph is cases, which means positive tests. Um, and the solid line is unvaccinated. So these are cases of unvaccinated people these are like millions of people. This is national data. Um, oh, 25 years, US jurisdictions. And it's, it's a huge data set. Um, unvaccinated, that's the Delta wave. And then here's the beginning of the Omicron wave. Um, and the dash line is fully vaccinated in general. Um, and you can see the difference when boosters were approved in the fall. Here's without a booster and here's with a booster. So a booster still definitely improves one's protection. And you see the difference in these graphs uh, between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated, although they do get closer in the Omicron era. Um, but as far as deaths over here on the right, um, dramatic, dramatic difference between those who had vaccine, even just a primary series, um, and uh, those who were unvaccinated. Um, and, and our, Vaccines have been extremely protective throughout, even though we, can, we are always concerned that our vaccines are maybe losing effectiveness. Um, but for a serious disease and deaths, I think um, they, you see the big difference between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. Um, then this was another study looking at people um, who went to emergency departments and urgent cares. So this is a different group of people. So you can say, uh, and this is people who were uh, symptomatic and some of them got hospitalized. Um, again, looking at uh, Delta and Omicron. Um, and this is their data set, it's a busy slide, but here's, these two columns are unvaccinated. This col these columns are fully vaccinated primary series, and this is fully vaccinated with a booster. And so here they broke it down by October, November, which we know was a Delta uh, era. Um, and IRR is the uh, relative risk, the incident relative risk. Um, so there's no difference between the groups and they're comparing vaccinated versus unvaccinated. There's no difference between the groups. This number is one. Um, so in the Delta era, people who had a primary series compared to unvaccinated, had a four time, uh, unvaccinated people had four times more disease than vaccinated. In the beginning of December, where we were, had more Omicron, um, that number dropped, but it was still almost three. Um, so still it did appear, even though this was early data, that our vaccinations um, did protect so that unvaccinated people had about three times more disease than vaccinated. Um, so these are cases, and again, this is from an ED, so these are symptomatic cases. Um, and then if we look at those with a booster, um, it was somewhat higher in the Omicron era than the primary series. It was closer to five, but certainly lower than the Delta era, which was at 13. So we see improvement with booster, even in the Omicron era, even though all those numbers are lower compared to the Delta era. Any questions? So this is a graphic that the CDC has put out um, 
adults who were unvaccinated had five times higher risk of infection. I think they should say to be actually accurate, symptomatic infection compared to with adults who were fully vaccinated with a booster. Um, so this is you know, one more piece of evidence that boosting, uh, particularly for people who are high risk um, is really important. Um, so um, this is another comparison and they, they, um, the number at the top is vaccine efficacy. So if it's looking at those numbers a different way, um, and during the Omicron predominant era, which we're not even gonna bother looking at Delta because we're all Omicron right now. Um, and in the Omicron predominant era, what they calculated vaccine efficacy um, as 52% if you had your second dose within um, six months. But if your second dose, if your primary series was more than six months, the efficacy of the vaccine was pretty low. Um, but with a third dose, um, vaccine jumped dramatically. And so third doses, um, and most of these third doses, they were just approved in the fall. So they had to be within six months. So whether it's the time or the third dose, we can't really say for sure from this data, uh, but certainly boosting um, has a dramatic effect um, on symptomatic disease here. Can you go back, can you define vaccine of efficacy again? I can't exactly. Um, it's how protective the vaccine is. So when you compare one group to another, that's from the original studies, they compared vaccine efficacy that way. So um, this doesn't mean 52% of people or 52, you know, got the disease. It's just when you compare one group to the other, um, one protects, one is protected, you know, more than the other. Okay. Um, so this is from the same study of urgent cares and emergency rooms uh, looking at hospitalizations. Um, and again, um, vaccine efficacy in the Omicron predominant era um, compared to unvaccinated. Um, even people who got just the primary series and it was uh, within the six months had very good vaccine efficacy. It did drop off somewhat um, if they had two doses more than six months um, and then went back up dramatically uh, with the third dose. So again, boosting was really important uh, to prevent hospitalization. And then this was uh, a, a similar article um, in a different journal um, in uh, JAMA. And they didn't have a graph to show you, so I just put their data in a little uh, chart for you. Looking at unvaccinated, they just compared unvaccinated versus uh, three doses. Um, and although uh, during Delta, again, relative risk means if there's no difference, um, it's one. Um, so during Delta, uh, having three doses was extremely protective. Um, during Omicron, less so, but still by a factor of three. Um, so still uh, impressive. Uh, and this, um, my husband wanted me to show this because this is from the New York Times, which um, it has more recent data. Uh, and again, unvaccinated, way higher, twice as high as fully vaccinated um, and deaths in the unvaccinated 20 times as high as fully vaccinated. Um, so in other news, um, this is a graphic from the CDC that, um, when they did a study that showed vaccination dramatically decreases uh, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome, which is a there can be life-threatening uh, inflammatory syndrome in young people, mainly teenagers. Um, and uh, vaccination reduced the likelihood of MISC by 91%. So that is a good reason to vaccinate those teens and young people. Um, and just one other piece of new information, um, there's new oral therapies becoming available. They're very, very short supply now, but over the next few weeks, um, they, the supply will get better. There's one called Paxlovid, that's the trade name because the generic name is way too hard to say. Um, and if, um, in high-risk patients, um, there was an 89% reduction in severe disease and hospitalization. Um, so very, very effective. Um, it is a little bit complicated because it has lots of drug interactions. So it's not for everyone. And for those who can't take it, uh, they can still get IV therapy, which we have, which is extremely effective as well. Um, and the other new drug is malnupiravir, um, which was not as effective 
but is a little bit easier to take. It does have some caveats. You can't use it in pregnant women and women and men of childbearing age have to use um, contraception um, uh, because it does have teratogenic potential. Um, so it has to be used carefully. I think that's all my news. Jo um, Joanne, the, um, we're, we're approaching that six month time frame from the booster. And so what's the latest data on that? Is another one coming? Are we, are, is our efficacy gonna decrease? I haven't seen that yet. And I'm sure there are a lot of people working on that. Does anybody else know anything about that? I haven't seen anything on that. I think that's the big question that a lot of us are waiting to hear about. I know they're working on an Omicron specific vaccine. It's already in trials. Um, there's really debate about whether that's a good idea not knowing what the next variant will be. Will, will it be closer to Omicron or will it be it closer to the original or nobody knows, nobody knows. Um, any other questions about the data? Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so let's move on on our agenda. Uh, onto old business, um, the mask mandate is still in place. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, uh, maybe, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. A question for Meredith. Are we getting complaints um, from um, the public about businesses not adhering to it? And Vivian's smiling. Mm -hmm. Uh, about business? Uh, no, very few, very few. I think it's just a norm part of the culture now, um, accepted widely. You know, I probably get anywhere from three to six emails a week asking when it's going to be over. Um, but complaint wise, I don't, it's not a lot. Okay, thank you. Meredith, do you have any recollection, and maybe this is something to bring next time, of when, what the rate was when we instituted the mask mandate and sort of where we are now compared to, I guess last fall. Well, we I'm can actually sure look our, at it. It was August, I think it was like mm -hmm. August 16th um, was the date that we reinstituted it. So if we go to Vivian's slide, she can look where the cases were mid-August. Do you have data that far back? Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we, 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 the writing was on the wall, we were continuously going up so we could kind of foresee what was going to happen. Um, so we were trying to do a little preventative work there. Right, I'm pretty sure our rates are still higher than where we were then. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Okay. Okay. Do we want to use the same metric? Good question. Yeah, I don't. It's right, the off ramp. What is that? What does it look like? Um, I don't think we can, honestly, Laurent, because it was all about community transmission and the number of cases per day. So the incident rate. We don't have a good data set for that because so many people are doing the antigen at home test. We have no idea what that real number is. I think the data point that we're really going to have to look at and you know, one of the primary reasons why we instituted it was to protect our healthcare systems, right? So I think that really needs to be the data point we look at for our off-ramp, not community transmission, because we have no idea really what's happening. Yeah, I can tell you from the hospital that uh, in the last uh, week or two, things have dramatically improved. Our peak was 26, and that's pretty high for a 100 bed hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and we're down to something like 15. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the patients who are not, not immunized uh, do tend to have long stays. Mm -hmm. And so we've really dropped off in our admissions. Um, and I think there's still people who are just, you know, staying longer, but we're not having a lot of new admissions. So I think everything's heading in the right direction there, but still quite a bit higher than, yeah. than when things are quiet. Sure. We have mm -hmm. had I think in June and July, there were days where there were weeks where there were zero COVID zero. patients. So yeah. that is achievable. Yeah. 
I and I think point. Bay State campuses went from 300, you know, a month ago to just under 200 this past week. So I'm, I'm almost wondering whether um, the mass metrics should be the hospitalization and the number of cases, since it's a milder form of COVID. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, at what point do we say, you know, 10 Omicron is worth one day of Delta? <laughs> Something like this. Um, and I guess the other thing is, what, what are other the towns and cities doing? What are they doing? Um, so almost everyone has one in place right now, but it's just more of recent. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, they usually put it in late and then shut it off early. So I, I really, that's not good data to go by. <laughs> It's just, okay, um, I, I, I want to look at strong data points to make those decisions. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, and I'm glad we didn't put a metric in when we um, enacted that policy. You know, just one thing we do know about COVID is it changes so rapidly. It's very hard to to make long-term goals like that. Who would have expected, you know, Omicron to be like the way it is? So um, well, I, think I, think just, we... I think just doing what we're doing and having the conversation, every board of health meeting, instead of setting a, you know, a, 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 a metric is probably the wisest thing to do. I know everybody wants to know when, everyone loves knowing, you know, an end date. Um. I think it contributes to very confusing messaging when it's masks, yes, mask, no, masking, yes, masking, no. People, people aren't paying attention to that changing status on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, they arrive someplace and there's a sign or there isn't a sign or the establishment is up to date on the signage or they're not. Um, I'd rather I'd rather keep the masking mandate until we have some assurance that the rates will be low, at least in the near future. I, it's hard to go back. I agree. And we don't want to also just look at a one data point. We want to see a sort of a trend over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments or um, opinions about the mask mandate? So it sounds like we're leaving it as is for now and we'll bring it up for every meeting. Okay, um, Senior Center, anybody have an um, <laughs> update or knowledge of how they're doing over there? So they're closed. Um, they, well, for in-service types of activities, they still do brown bag and they're doing virtual, but um, as of right now, no members are allowed inside. Um, we've been using it as a testing center two days a week, which has been going really well. Um, it's not being utilized as much as I thought it would. The, our testing numbers are really low. And I just don't know if it's people aren't testing as much, you know, as they were two weeks ago. Um, but we've made that a walk-in also. You don't need an appointment to go there. Um, I do believe um, Marie had mentioned maybe mid-February or the first week of March, she'll open back up to the members. Amy, do you have a pulse on that? Did she mention it the other day? She mentioned the 16th, but not February. Not firm, not firm of February. Mm -hmm. Well, if rates continue to drop the, at the rate they are, things will improve dramatically soon. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, anytime any epidemiologist had made, has made any predictions in this pandemic, they've all been wrong. <laughs> so we'll believe it when we see it. and scary, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I just wanna address one other piece of old business that um, you guys asked me about last time when we were made our rules for our meeting. Um, the question was whether to share documents um, with the public 
um, that you'll be looking at at the meeting. And I did ask um, Attorney Seawald um, what he thought. And he said it is not required by open meeting law, um, uh, but he has no objection to it. I think it's, he thinks in general, it might be a good practice. It's an open, um, open practice, but it's totally up to, up to us. I guess my opinion is I don't mind sharing things with the public. I, I, I'm hesitant to share things with the public that you guys haven't seen before, or we haven't had a chance to talk about, like something that's completely new. I'm hesitant to share with the public until we've had a chance to discuss it. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Given that we continue to have um, uh, letters to the editor and op-ed pieces about a vaccine mandate for restaurants and bars that we never even drafted, um, people expressing opposition as if we debated that policy, I think it's really tricky to put out documents that are just documents for discussion, um, not anything that we have made a decision on. There's, there just seems to be ongoing confusion about that particular issue and nothing was ever written. I can imagine it could be very confusing if we put something out that's written. I think draft gets lost. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with you. And I, you know, the vaccine mandate, it was an agenda item. That's right. At my suggestion that we talk about it. And that's how it all sort of blew up from there. So we have to be very, I think we have to be careful what we're, I mean, I don't want to be so careful about what we're bringing up. I want to feel like we have freedom to discuss with each other. Uh, on the other hand, I, I agree that written things can be misconstrued. Um, and um, I think the board members should really have the right to see things and discuss them before they become public. Um, totally up to you. Up till now, we've been um, uh, sending some documents to the board members, but not putting them, atta attaching them to the uh, public agenda. So any other comments on how to proceed? Um, hey, well, let's, let's see, could you, could you, um describe it, this would have done before the Zoom era. I don't know, Meredith? What's the question? When we, before we started to meet on Zoom and we'd meet in person at the town hall, so, sorry, the city hall, um, there would be paper copies of these various documents and the public could have it on the day that they can, they came, correct? Mm -hmm. Request a copy and look at it. But not they weren't posted with the agenda. No, they weren't they were posted with posted. the agenda. They were made available at the time of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm just wondering whether a document when it's being discussed on Zoom should just be uh, displayed as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, a whiz mate. The the thing is, so the issue is you get a project of an order, and before uh, before it's discussed between us, it gets spun out of control, right? Uh, and it's even if there's a watermark or clearly draft for discussion only, not for decision, you could put this in red, red, red it, it could still be an issue. Um, so it, it needs to be put in context. So I think it's, it's shared at the time of the meeting as a display. I suppose the someone who'd want to participate and get the information can, you know, do a screen capture, but we need to discuss it freely and almost go page by page. The other thing is sometimes, you know, when we have draft minutes, obviously those minutes are going to be modified because we want to, you know, change a, a dot or so suddenly we find a huge amount of draft minutes that are circulating that may be saying things we don't we didn't say. I don't, I don't think meeting. we have ever, ever had the intention of circulating draft minutes to the public. Okay. They're only pu publicized when they're final. I wouldn't include minutes in that in that scenario. So I guess, I guess as long as it's not a misconstrued agenda and it's it's transparent what we're discussing, which we've been doing so far, I'm inclined to leave that as that it is. Okay. Cynthia, do you want to weigh in? Can I just, before, Cynthia, before you go, going back to your question, Oh, you're frozen. Meredith said her internet was 
unstable, just when she started speaking. Um, Cynthia, do you want to comment while we're waiting? Um, yeah, sure. So I, I guess what you were saying, Joanne, was that there is not a requirement to do this. Is that right? Correct. And so um, as long as we know that, I don't think um, we can do guidelines or, you know, I mean, every situation is going to be different. So well, I, for me, I need to make that decision mm -hmm. sort of when I, I have draft documents, um, whether to attach them to an agenda that goes public or not. There was some discussion that maybe all those documents should be public, but it sounds like the consensus yeah. is not. Yeah. Okay. Meredith, I'm sorry. You, uh, <laughs> you were unstable. <laughs> it's not the first time I've been told that. Um, so going back to your question about when we actually met in the hearing room, the only time we provided hard copies is if we had a hearing. If we had a hearing about some type of policy and we were discussing the draft, we never ever provided documents of anything else that was on our agenda item. Got it. People who came and presented would provide extra copies for the audience if they were there, if they had a presentation, but there are no other documents that are provided. And okay. those documents were public already, were yeah. made public for the purpose of the forum. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. I think I, I think I hear you. Um, so I don't think we need to take a vote, but that'll just, we'll just. Um, move on. Um, okay. Um, COVID-19 updates. Um, we've already talked about the vaccine efforts. Um, best practices for businesses. We had talked last time about um, venues, um, concert venues where people are sitting shoulder to shoulder that Meredith had caused, called a sort of auditorium seating. And the question had come up whether we wanted to mandate a certain procedure um, and we said, no, we don't want to do that, but we would like to publicize best practices. Um, so I drafted, see if I can find them. I drafted something that we could use for best practices. And you, I want to hear from you if you think what you think, if this reflects what we discussed. So let me try to share. Mm. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there, mm -hmm. there's two documents, isn't that correct? Um, there's another one that's more geared for restaurants. Um, this one I wrote more specifically for concert venues because our, our thought was uh, to talk about that patrons should be masked when they're in the concert area. And if there's food and drink, it should be in a separate area so that people who choose not to take off their mask, don't have to mix with people who are eating and drinking. That was the essence of it. Um, so um, we sent this around. I don't know if you've all had a chance to look at this. Um, can, I, can I make a general comment? Yes. About, even, about doing this? Um, after looking at the two documents, so the one that's up there now, the mm -hmm. concert venues, and also one that came a little bit later, which yep. was about, you said it was restaurants, it says businesses. Yep. Um, stylistically, the second one was um, much more direct, much more like this is the recommendation. The, this one on concert venues is like, the venue would ideally, but if you want to, you might decide. <laughs> And I think we have, we're in a position, since we're not doing a policy, to say, this is the recommendation, mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of, you know, wording it so that we're kind of in and out of a different variety of scenarios. And um, I, I would also say that um, the one thing we do know, the one thing we do know that we have to keep talking about is we do know the high efficacy rate of vaccinations. And I think we should put that in any document uh, that in masks that we distribute to all these areas where we're giving these best practices. So those just some general comments. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you would say like in this paragraph, take out that if the venue decides to serve food and drink and take <laughs> out ideally, just say the venue should not, right? These are these are aspirational. These are best Absolutely. practices. Yeah. Um, I mean, or there can be an argument I wanna hear mm -hmm. on the board members, like maybe we wanna soften it up, um, but I, I just feel pretty strongly about it. I mean, we don't have to be harsh, but it should be just a little more directed. Yeah, I, I agree that the one for businesses um, is more direct and um, I think easier to grasp because mm -hmm. of, of, of the format. However, I don't think it's clear at all for the best practices for business that these are recommendations. I know it says goals, but for the health department to put out um, uh, uh, this list to to certain businesses. I think it's lost in there that this is a recommendation and not a mandate. Well, I think that that will become clear. Um, so I, I just like to look at one document at a time. I can sort of put this in a similar format to the other one, if you prefer. Um, did you have a chance to look at the content here? Is this content that you agree with? Uh, things like, you know, up to date on COVID vaccination. I don't know if, if we need to um, say what up to date means. You say up to date a couple of times too on the other one as well. Um, so that's I, the new CDC terminology instead of saying vaccinated and boosted. Sure. Um, and, but does the business owner or the, the venue owner know that language? Okay. So that, I mean, that's going to keep changing what it means mm -hmm. if it's boosted. If we get another booster, it's going to be two boosters. You know, that it's yeah. complicated. I was trying to keep this as simple as possible. Sure. And if someone had questions that they could discuss it with Meredith or Amy or, you know, um, and obviously hygiene, there's a lot more to hygiene. Um, there's a lot more to any of these recommendations. Um, I was trying to balance being sort of simple and straightforward. Um, they're not getting in the weeds too much. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, some of the, I, I think if we're putting both of these out at some point, some of the language from one document can be transposed into the other. And I, and I think they need to have the same language about things like hygiene, vaccination, ventilation, um, okay. training, um, so that there's some continuity and, 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 and helps with clarity. Okay. So why don't I redo this document pretty much to make it look like the other one and I'll bring up the other one in one second, um, except for the part about my masking is more specific here. Does that sound right? Um, yes, and do can we not say should be encouraged, but patrons should wear a mask, quality, high quality mask. Mm -hmm. okay. I think they should be encouraged had to do with the type of mask. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I heard what Amy Kahling said in the public comment, and I think it would be very helpful to share these in draft form with her so that she can review them with her constituents because I think she's absolutely right. They have the experience. They're the ones that are, um, are tasked with doing this. And um, I learned a lot from Lauren going around and talking to various folks. I found that to be very helpful. Um, and I think we can, it, it can help to, to get their input and help the implementation if, if, if they're involved. So I, I, would, I would recommend we do that before voting on anything. Um, so I'll just share with you that, um, let me just bring up that document if I have the right one here. 
Yep. Okay. So I'll just share with you that um, first, uh, Amy Hutchinson and I met and reviewed, um, sort of came up with some ideas. And actually, we got into the weeds into a lot more detail than this. And then I realized we needed to sort of keep it simple as a guideline. Um, and then actually, Amy Hutchinson and I met with Amy Kahalane. And Amy Kahalane, I think, is still here if we wanted to invite her into the discussion um, and um, review these. And I guess we went around and around a bit about what the best way would be to use these, like how can we entice and encourage restaurants um, to do these practices or want to do these practices. Um, and um, I think last I heard, uh, well, do you want to invite Amy to enjoy, uh, join our discussion? Sure, because I must have misunderstood what she was saying. Yeah, so, so we had a discussion and I think um, her latest opinion is that maybe uh, to start engaging with the restaurants uh, and the businesses um, and to maybe even start with a survey of them and say, hey, here are some ideas that the Board of Health thinks are important. What do you think about this? What are your barriers? What are your concerns? What, you know, what do you think of all this? And just to really get their feedback. The other option is um, a forum, is to hold a forum, a dedicated time where people can come and, and just talk about it. Um, so really to engage the business community on this um, so that we are clear uh, about really what their barriers are, what their thoughts are um, about all this. There are some businesses who really want to be recognized for changes that they've made in their businesses. And some, some businesses have spent a lot of money already on ventilation. Um, and other businesses probably will find that this is just a real pain in the neck. Um, so Meredith, can you um, unmute? I did. I'm, oh, I'm unmuted. Amy. Hello. You're, you're, hi, I can't see you. Um, I'm not allowed to be seen, I don't think. Oh, okay. But I... Um, <laughs> you are your co-host. <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, and so do you want to talk about um, your opinion on how, sort of how to move forward with this? Um, sure. I am in favor of all of the things that you just listed. I think there can't be enough outreach to the businesses. Um, I think that uh, a forum, I think a focus group, um, means of allowing the businesses to actually interact with you um, would be really helpful in trying to figure out what this document should be and how it's used. Um, I think public comments, that very one-sided um, conversation gets very frustrating and I think they would appreciate a back and forth. Um, I think there are a lot of businesses who are already doing many of the things that are on here. And I think it would be great for you to know that. Um, I think they feel sometimes like they're out downtown yelling into the wind that we're doing all these wonderful things and, and nobody knows. So it would be great to find a way to recognize that. Um, and then for those, um, Talking about ventilation, I think I had emailed Amy H. Um, I had a conversation with a business owner um, who suggested the survey because there are a lot of businesses who have put a tremendous amount of money and effort into installing ventilation. Um, and I don't know that any of you are aware of that. And it would be great to find out who has done what and who is already in compliance with this. And I think all of that outreach would foster um, a sense that this was a joint effort, that you were there to support them, that we were all working towards the same goal as opposed to a, just a one-sided or top-down um, approach. I don't know if that answered your question in particular, but that's where my head is. Great, and um, I think the latest thing I heard about via email is that you thought maybe uh, to start with a survey? A survey felt like a good way, again, to get a sense of who is already doing these things. Um, to get a sense of who has what ventilation um, and to for businesses that haven't been able to install or haven't chosen to install ventilation, I think it might be useful to learn a little bit more about what their barriers are. And that might help all of you decide um, how to use your resources. So um, maybe it's a, a funding, the businesses just can't afford it right now. And you could use your resources to try and direct city funding to support that. Maybe they have landlords that don't want it. Maybe they're an old building and they can't do the ventilation. Um, but I, a survey and a conversation like a forum or a um, focus group, I think would be great ways to 
get a little bit more into that topic. And when you say focus group, what did you have in mind? A few bu chosen business owners or? I, I think so. I guess I had, I had thought about it only in terms of, I think a forum has to be open to anyone. And I was trying to come up with a way that it could be a conversation focused around the business owners that will be tasked with implementing this or that will be you know, presented this. Um, so yes, I think smaller groups. I'd want to think, I guess, a little bit or talk to someone about how, who would be part of that or whether there would be a couple of different focus groups for different size restaurants or types or I don't know, but a smaller group. Amy, Amy. I just want to understand that, that as far as sequence is concerned, you would propose that these activities occur before we move forward with putting out any recommendations. Is that, do I understand that correctly? That would be my suggestion, yes. Thank you. And Amy, if we did a survey of, of some of the things that you suggested, which I think is very interesting um, because you said that a lot of the businesses are already doing some of these things. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about publicizing that so that the public knows which businesses are doing what? Well, it's true that a form would help at publicity because the public can, I mean, if it becomes a, a business come and explain what they've been doing, be excellent to know and I'm, the opportunity for them to explain and describe it. That'd be great. Um, in terms of publicizing survey results, I certainly would have no problem um, in publicizing um, numbers aggregated. So mm -hmm. 10 of our downtown restaurants are doing X. Um, I think I would want to think a little bit more about publicizing which restaurants, um, the vaccination of patrons, for example, I'm sure would be the hot button one. Um, I mean, I guess it's public knowledge. So maybe there wouldn't be an issue. I think I'd want to think about it a minute. It, it makes me hesitate a little bit, but I'm, I'm not sure I can articulate right, why right now. Um, and I'd want the businesses to feel like they could respond honestly too. So I think if we were asking them questions about barriers to ventilation or barriers to vaccination of either patrons or staff, um, if they knew that those results were going to be publicized, would we get um, as useful an answer? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, think been, I think we've been struggling how to make the public aware of which establishments already have a vaccine mandate that have gone forward with with that voluntarily there's no way for the public to know that now and there are and there are many in the public who would want to know that except um by each restaurant that's doing that publicizing it as they see appropriate right i have to I'm, say I, go ahead go sorry ahead. no 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 go ahead I'm not sure that the Board of Health would be the entity that would want to get involved in the, the marketing or publicity of certain businesses over others. Um, it feels to me like you, your role in supporting them in guiding them and encouraging them towards the end goals that you all have in mind um, feels great. I get worried when it's um, publicizing, publicizing certain restaurants over others. Go ahead, Laurent. Um, I, I think what, what I found to be difficult with those recommendations is we don't know what's coming next. We don't know whether we're going to, the spring's going to come and everybody's going to be happy again and there'll be a micro variant that's like nothing and it'll be a wonderful summer and this will be fading away and we'll forget about it. Or whether we have another variant that's going to be a pain in the neck. Uh, and, and half of those recommendation will be either not relevant or not strong enough. And, and so in, at the end, it looks to me that we can move something, have a discussion about this, take our time. Um, right now, it's not gonna address Omicron. The, va the wave is going by itself, it's going down by itself. I'm almost prepared to say that if we lifted the mask order tomorrow, it would continue to go down. 
And that's the thing that I found so hard about our work as making policy is um, <laughs> it's so hard to tell if it's having uh, this local effect that we want, have to, we want it to have. So um, I, I, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say my opinion, um, the reason I included these particular things and it was uh, Amy Hutchins uh, recommended that bottom one, the communication policies and training, but these public health pres uh, principles have been the same throughout the pandemic. I mean, some of them are more <laughs> effective or less effective depending on your variant, um, but vaccination, <laughs> vaccination, vaccination is number one, um, masks, um, hygiene, don't come to work if you're sick, and ventilation have been the, have just been the basic public health policy since the beginning and have not really changed. Um, I think ventilation has not gotten enough um, airplay um, and it's, you know, scary to people. They don't understand it and they think it's always very expensive and it's not always true, but it's true that it is complicated, um, but it's not always very expensive. Um, um, so I don't think that it's likely that with another variant that these are going to go away. Maybe we'd add something, maybe, I don't know. Um, but yeah. if a variant had become, if the next variant is a weaker version of Omicron, do we think that this vaccination requirement makes any <laughs> sense? Is what I'm, I'm trying to get at is, I agree, vaccination is great. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we don't, again, because we're now in a different world that we were several months ago, when I would have said exactly the opposite, is if we had a weaker Omicron variant coming up next, um, that we would be treating like the flu, let's say, um, would that vaccination still be on the number one on that list? I think so, because uh, people at high risk get sick. Unless this virus really changes dramatically to be a cold, um, I think it's likely, I think it's very likely that vaccination will still be the backbone of our public health intervention. Like, you know, no one can tell us what's, what's coming, but I do think so. I, I wouldn't want to give a message of, backing away from that. Maybe I, that's too strong of saying backing away, but I, I think we have got to keep that front and center. Yeah, but we have to recognize that things do change and, and we, yeah. we, we realize that it's, we, we're not talking about the early variant. And again, several months ago, I would have said, yes, by all means, vaccinate everyone. But if we're now in an Omicron version, there's a, there's a reason we didn't put a vaccine mandate is because we recognize things are changing. And um, I would say, yes, go ahead, please. I'm getting my flu shot every year. I don't have a problem with this and I will get it every year until I die, I think. Um, and, but that is different. That is different from telling businesses um, you, you, you should put a mandate. On the vaccine, I think maybe some businesses, but I if 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 the next variant is a weak version of Omicron, it's it's getting to be a little bit strange to do that. It's just this is not a policy. This is just a recommendation. What? Yeah. So why can't we just put out the best practices as they are today and provide them to the businesses? I mean, that's information that's super useful. Um, I'd like. You know, I think we're assuming that all businesses know these are the things that you need to do to reduce transmission within your facility for your patrons and for your employees, but that's a leap. I, I don't think people really know that. And so instead of getting hung up on what to do with this, because I'm afraid that's what's going to happen, like these pr best practices are so relevant right now. And some businesses don't have this information. So what harm could it do if we just emailed, did a hard copy mail to the businesses, letting them know that the, you know, the Northampton Board of Health makes these recommendations. And what you can do at this point is awesome. You know, again, it's every strategy that they can implement we're reducing the risk of transmission. And that's what we should be focusing on. I don't, you know, how... I think, you know, I don't, 
like Amy said, I don't want this to be top down. I want to get their voice. I want them to be heard also. But this is really time sensitive. Like we could have put this document out two weeks ago, you know, or what have you. I just feel like it's really good, relevant information and it shouldn't get tied up any longer than it has to. I, I agree with that, but I think the mess, we have to be very sensitive about the messaging. I think a casual reader would read the one from businesses as this being a vaccine ma mandate. Patrons of businesses are, are admitted only if they are up to date on COVID vaccination. Mm -hmm. So the title is best practice goals. And that's our opinion, our recommendation from the Board of Health. It's not a mandate. It's not a rule. It's not a policy. I just don't think that's clear enough. Well, we can, I mean, we can certainly wordsmith, but I, I'm in 100% agreement with Meredith. I, I mean, I, there's two things here, getting the message out and engaging with businesses. And I think we need to get the message out. And I think we can wordsmith some of this. Like, I'm, I'm not really into goals. I just think recommendations, you know, mm -hmm. from your board of health. This is it. Do you want me to change the word goals to recommendations? That's that's a preference, but I don't want to, you know. So it's very know. clear that it's a recommendation and nothing more than that? I think it would be recommended best practices. <laughs> <laughs> or it can just be best practices. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't, it's not even, you know, I mean, I would think there's going to be a cover document to this and saying this is what we think you should do, or this is best what practices for what, though? Please make that clear at the end of yeah. the sentence. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Um, best practices for reduce, reducing COVID transmission within right. your business. That's, that's the headline. Mm -hmm. That's the headline. Yeah. Whoa, there's oh, Russian. Oh, sorry. That's cool. Hebrew. Wait, no, Hebrew. it's Hebrew. Hebrew. Oh, cool. <laughs> we might get more compliance if we put it in Hebrew. <laughs> to reduce COVID transmission. Can I ask a question? Is the plan that this is then just going to be emailed out as the health department emails out other things? Um, as just guidance for businesses? That's what I would imagine. <clears throat> so Meredith, um, but maybe with a cover letter really explaining, maybe with a cover right. letter, um, do you think this should go out with a questionnaire um, at the same time? Well, I think there's two things that could happen. I mean, no, we could put this out with a cover letter, Joanne. And then Amy, if you can, if you want to still move forward, I don't remember which business offered to do a survey to see what's out there, who's doing what, and just giving us aggregate data. I think that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to do a survey. Um, <coughs> I think that conversation originally came up um, when there was a discussion about doing something more with this best practices than sending it out with a cover letter as a recommendation from the Board of Health. Um, but I think there's useful information to be gathered, so I'm happy to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I mean, that information can help us drive our work moving forward. Not only our work, you know, we can bring this to the mayor and perhaps you know, with some of the ARPA money, it can help support the businesses in some fashion. So that's what I was hoping. So I don't sure. want to speak for, but I'm just, you know, that money's there. Mm -hmm. We could still do the focus group idea mm. to give businesses a, a forum to have a conversation. And I'm, I'm thinking even if one of us did the focus group or someone else did it, it wouldn't have to be an open meeting. But I, I don't know, that's moving forward. So. I think the opportunity, not, can I speak? The sure. opportunity for the businesses to have a back and forth with one or some of you um, would be incredibly welcome. I think it would be helpful to have all of us there so we could all yeah. be hearing the same if, information. I think if that was possible with public meeting law, that'd be great. Really, yeah, isn't I mean, that the point of a forum? Because we had forum and it was back and forth. Yeah, yeah. a form, format, um, I think we can engage. Um, and I think I know the forums have to be open, but to the extent that it could be geared towards a business conversation, I think that would be useful. 
I, I, so I have a difference of opinion here. I think uh, <laughs> smaller, more intimate focus groups, um, we'd probably be able to extract more information and really kind of get more granular, um, having more opportunities for dialogue. And we can do it by, like Amy suggested, business types, you know, um, versus one large forum. <clears throat> and we might be able to get more people at the table if we do them all different times of days um, than just having one opportunity. So that would be, uh, that's what I would advocate for. I know it's a little more legwork, <clears throat> but I think it would, what it would produce would be a lot more beneficial. So Meredith, are you advocating that it not be a full board that meets so it doesn't have to be exactly open? yeah that I, it be one one or two board members mm -hmm. um i think two is allowed um or one board member with a uh, department of health staff and yeah. encouraging different sized businesses at different times mm -hmm. and it yeah <clears throat> i don't have a vote but i wholeheartedly endorse that uh, does anyone have thoughts about the order in which we do things? Um, are we going to send this to every business before we hold these forums? I would, I would, I would, how, how would that feel that. to them? Yeah. Cynthia? I, I would recommend that. And we could put an explanation about what, you know, those next steps of the forums. Mm -hmm. I, but, I think the that there's no rush and we should really think and <clears throat> be mindful as we you know put these forms together what the questions are what the information is that we're looking for i mean we're trying to do this before the next wave if there is a wave of something right we're trying to prepare for to gather this information so we don't have to rush it where i would love to see these recommendations <clears throat> get out there to the businesses right now for those who don't have the information like this is what's you know recommended so Meredith, maybe you and I can craft a cover letter to go with these that explains <laughs> that these are the rec public health recommendations based on, you know, CDC recommendations that have been throughout the pandemic and we want to make sure you know about them, um, but also to let you know that our plan is to have an opportunity for you to speak mm -hmm. um, and, and tell us, you know, your point of view and your, you know, mm -hmm. whatever your issues are. Does that make sense to have a cover letter that that lets them know there's a plan for them to voice their their opinion you think that would feel okay to them are you asking me yes <laughs> oh sorry um yes i think that would be great does that sound reasonable so to to send these out relatively soon but with a cover letter explaining that there'll be a, more of a process coming okay and in the um, so, cover letter, Joanne, if we could mm -hmm. add um, about vaccination efforts and, you know, we can go to their businesses about the testing that's happening still in Northampton, be all inclusive, because I've sure. been meaning to write that again anyways. So right. good opportunity. Um, <clears throat> that we have best practices <clears throat> and then forums for discussion. Okay. And very clearly that these are recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I do want to do before we leave this subject, I want to make sure I want to go over the content. If you agree with the content here, um, Amy Hutchins has a much expanded document that gives uh, businesses <laughs> a lot of detail about how what are your policies supposed to look like, you know, here you can, you can take a document and take out what you don't do and leave in what you do do and, and then develop a policy right from her document um best practices for um hand hygiene health policies communication so there's a lot more detail available um i don't i don't think we were ready to send out a huge document that other huge document now but certainly if people uh call the health department um amy uh, has a lot of information she can help them learn um so does uh how are you with this content um, vaccination of staff, employees are up to date. Do you want me to I'll, um, put an asterisk there and explain what up to date means? I, I mean, there was there was a mm -hmm. comment that maybe businesses don't know. No, so I don't. I okay. Yes, I can add. Um, I can add ex explanation. 
and I can include a reference to the CDC um, of up to date. And okay. in, regarding and regarding staff, this document did not mention like the other document did that staff should not work if they're ill. Yeah, so um, that's under best practices for employee health. Um, I'll add could add that specific language. Um, Uh, what's the best way to say that? No, that's probably not the best way. That's also in the food code too. So they're, mm -hmm. they're doing it for, because they're a restaurant, but they're also mm -hmm. okay. for COVID too. Um, compliance with mask order. So vaccination up to date with, on COVID vaccination. Patrons are admitted only if they're up to date on COVID vaccination. I mean, these are ways of getting people vaccinated. And um, I think that's best practice. Um, we're not forcing anybody. Um, Employees and patrons are masked according to Northampton DPH mask order recommendation. Um, I would say there, I mean, there could be a state mask order at some point if we have a <laughs> democratic governor again. Um, so can I add, uh, I was gonna add or state mask order. Um, hygiene and health policies, employer em provides employees and patrons easily accessible hand hygiene alcohol rub throughout establishment. Employer follows best practices for employee health, including not allowing sick employees to work. Ventilation. And, mm -hmm. um, is there any specific recommendation for rest for public rest restrooms, or will that handle that under hygiene? I'm not sure what your question is. Um, do restaurant do restrooms have to be equipped differently? Do they have to have hand hygiene or those sanitizer things? Is there any guidance on that at all? Um, soap and water is perfectly acceptable. So bathrooms okay. that have soap and water are fine. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess when you get into the detail, you don't want to have a, one of those rotating re reusable towels. Um, gotcha. But I don't oh, think we've seen yeah, those there, anymore. <laughs> there are more strict guidelines in the federal food code that are superseding what you have here mm -hmm. in your document, Joanne. OK. Um, So is there something you think I should take out? Easy. Meredith? Um, no, because you're just asking them to, um, easy, they already have easily accessible hand hygiene as in um, hand wash stations where, any, yep. where everyone is doing food preparation. So those are already there. We don't, you know, if, bathrooms are separate they're not supposed to be washing their hands well you have to wash your hands after you use the bathroom but then they have to wash their hands in the kitchen again so i think you're just adding um the suggestion of an alcohol rub or something throughout some type of disinfectant that's throughout. for the so that's for the patrons that's different from what the food oh. would have right oh employees and patrons okay gotcha okay um Ventilation, I mean, it's such a complicated subject. And the other one I said, CDC or ASHRAE, which is the organization that certifies. Um, the other one I was specific on this one just says COVID appropriate. I don't know what the best language is. Um, Can I just add something here? Like we know, and I, I, I'm making this up, like the MERV 12 is the best standard, whatever. Mm -hmm. 14. Yep. People don't understand ventilation. I don't even understand ventilation. And if someone doesn't have that, what can they do now? Maybe we can give some best practices on, you know, put a box fan, you know, in the dining room to help circulate air, whatever that is, so they can improve the in ventilation. Maybe there should be some suggestions underneath there. Cause I just, I don't think anyone really knows and no one's gonna go to the ASHRAE website. Maybe a few people will, but. There is, um, I was reading recently about a, a very cheap box, which is called a, a Corsi Rosental box, where you take a box fan 
and you put in you you take that box fan and put in the cube <coughs> and on the face of the cubes you put some filters and in the process that fan circulates air it pulls you know it pulls the air on one side of the of the fan and pushes it through those filters and uh, so it might be a way of have to look into this but it might be a it's a very inexpensive way of of creating a some sort of ventilation system yeah so that could cost about 20 bucks so i have a box fan and you can actually take a hepa filter and tape it with duct tape mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. it there can't be any holes in the duct tape um, but it's really cheap and um it is it is it does help um but i think a more appropriate item for a restaurant um, would be just portable plug-in HEPA filters. Um, the problem is that they have to be sized appropriately to the size of the room or to the size mm -hmm. of the airspace. Um, but there is information um, I can add um, the CDC reference on there. Um, that on how to figure out what size HEPA filter you need for what size room you need to take your height width and you know dimensions of your room in square feet um, and then look at your uh, HEPA filter um, and and figure out if it's moving enough air for the amount of air you have um, and so when people actually get into it it's not that difficult but for people who haven't even begun thinking about this this is all you know complicated um, so I was, the problem here is that I don't feel like I have enough knowledge to really be the local expert. And um, here's where I was hoping that we could get some money from the city to even hire some consultant time to like have us, have us understand what the options are. Um, I know it, I understand it a little bit, um, but um, I don't think we understand it enough to write it out in a document like this. I don't anyway. I'm also wondering whether you can have some sort of metrics, which is simply the CO2 levels. So the interesting thing is that if you're using central air and you're <laughs> using air exchanges, meaning you bring in fresh air as part of your air and you're getting rid of your old air, um, you can use CO2 levels as a good metric. But if you're using HEPA filters, no, it's not going to make a difference. Yeah. Cleaning the air of virus, but it's not cleaning the air of CO2. No, no, the fan is made. It's true. It needs to be air. It needs to be, they need to be an air intake and, and so on. Um, you, it's not, essentially a fan just moves air through, through an EPA filter, but it's, this does not going to change CO2. Right. Um, but I suppose that if you have high CO2, you can always prop up in the door, <laughs> short of a, short of a, 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 a complicated HVAC system. But if you have HEPA filters, it doesn't matter if you have a high CO2, right? You're still cleaning the air of viral particles. So it's confusing. It's all very confusing. These filters um, can be costly. And I think it would be helpful for people who would be considering this expense if they had any idea that we were considering um, trying to get city funding for this. I, I, would, I, would feel, I would feel responsible if people put out a, a substantial investment in this and then found out later that they could have um, gotten some resources from the city. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't feel fair. I know we can't promise that, but we could say that we're going to be talking to the, the, the city about that. We can include that as something that we're doing in this cover letter. Right. Um, but there's not a guarantee. I wouldn't want I, people I to understand. wait understand. a long time and not do some simple things um, waiting for funding. It's a trade off. Any other comments about this document? I mean, I can up, you know, explain up to date, put in a CDC reference. Anything else? Um, we could put on here, um, Amy Hutchins, are you available if businesses want to talk more detail? Because this is a very vague document. If they want it, can we put that your, uh, or put in the cover letter that, that you're available to give more specific recommendations um, 
except maybe the ventilation piece. Yeah. Um, exactly. Because you, you, you've gone into great detail in thinking about how, how businesses might implement some of these things. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So we'll put in your, your home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, any other um, comments about this document? So it sounds like we agreed that we want to send it out soon. We would write a cover letter explaining that these are recommendations. These are best practices based on basic public health principles. Um, and um, that we do want to, we have planned, we will plan um, to hear their voices um, in a variety of ways. Um, and that they can call Amy if they have questions. <laughs> Does that sound reasonable? Great. Great, great. Um, any other questions or comments before we go into minutes? And we're leaving the concert venue one for another time. Um, well, you wanted me to, to put that more in the format of the first one. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, just wanted. And do we wanna do the same? That's a good question. Do we wanna do the same thing, send that to the venues with, do we want their input or how do we wanna approach them? Why not? Similar kind of cover letter? Sure. I mean, I, I, I think we need to be aware that we don't know what we don't know <laughs> about how this, how, what's involved in implementing this on the ground. Lauren had some conversations directly with people, but, but we're not, this is a one, so far been a one-sided conversation other than the public comment period. So, I think we need to involve folks as much as possible to make this something that people buy into. So we would have a focus group for those folks as well to come. Right. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, just a, a comment, um, because we have some businesses like or venues like the Academy and restaurants that are doing um requiring vaccination right so we don't want this document to conflict with anything that they're already doing if they want a higher standard and i think by um the very first item on the on the one for businesses vaccination of staff employees are up to date on covid vaccinations and then vaccination of patrons patrons of the business are admitted only if they're up to date so that I think I'm answering, I just want to highlight that those that have the higher standard, that's what we're putting forth is the higher standard. Right, okay. These are best practices. These aren't the only way to yeah. run a business. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it says businesses, but we're really focusing on food establishments, right? Because those are the businesses where people take off their mask. Um, but it does just say businesses. We want to change the title. Or do we want to let any business, any, this really is applicable to any public space where, you know, the public goes. Um, but I think the focus, my focus was, was for food establishments. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm wondering how a clothing store like Synergy would be like, oh, well, they're saying I got to, you know, for customers to come in. But I, I, I just want to make it known that we're giving the higher standard, that's all. I can think of one example is the barber. The barber? Mm -hmm. Example the, of what? Of, a, of, a, of an establishment where it might be relevant. Because I, I went at, I forgot the name of their business. And you had um, to take off your mask. To I took off beard. my mask, yes. So that may be relevant to them. Um, I, but I can think of only one business that does it. I'm, I'm a little confused, Lauren. You're taking off your mask, going to the barber? To trim his beard. Yeah. Ah, for your beard. How I was actually thinking. <laughs> how gender insensitive I am. <laughs> I was actually wondering if spas and hair salons have more patrons who take off their mask, you know, mm -hmm. waxing or whatever it is that they do, if that would be appropriate for those venues as well. Amy. Mask, 
I would just say um, if you are targeting certain businesses to be specific in the title, and if you put out a document that just says best practices for businesses, we're going to read that as best practices for all businesses, yeah. in which case I would suggest forums for all businesses. And I don't know that that's really your goal. So I would just vote for specificity in the title. There are some hair salons in town that are um, scattering their appointments um, just based on their own practices. So, yeah. And the next one I can think is the dentist also, but I mean, I'm sure they've already have something in place. They have to follow uh, medical, medical codes, I believe. The language about food and drink is actually in the other document for concert venues. There's no specific language for food or drink in the businesses. If that's the one we're going to specify for bars and restaurants. It, it could be one document if we want to consider that. Merging the two. It, there, there is there is some specific language about areas to serve food and drink that are specific to the venues. Um, the, the, the recommendation on masking is similar. Yeah. We don't talk about social distancing for restaurants and bars. That's a good point, and we probably should recommend it, no? On the other document, I put it in uh, when mask orders or recommendations are in place, meaning if we're in a situation in the pandemic where a mask order is appropriate, then social distancing would also be appropriate. Um, and when a mask order is lifted, do you still need social distancing? So I could combine these documents and call them um, in food establishments and venues and just add the appropriate things under the appropriate categories. So the, the outliers really are food, food and drink, and auditorium style, right? Those are the sort of three differences. So if we can make it clear that those three things are different. Uh, Mm. <clears throat> so I think in restaurants, you want when people are seated at the table, they can have their mask off. But if they get up to go to the bathroom, they should have their mask on. I think that's hard in bars and a lot of bars where people stand. We haven't really ever figured out our way around that. Right. Right. Um, and then I could add that comment about the venues from the other document. Um, do you want to put these together?
I, I personally think they should be, but I don't know if there's a, other thoughts about that. I think it's, I think it's appropriate to merge them. And to add um, something on social distancing. Oh no, my formatting's a mess. We don't generally ask the restaurants to do this, but it's not because we don't believe in it. I think it's going to end up being a, which I like about the idea of merging, it's, it becomes a menu. There are things that are clearly very difficult to implement in certain areas and not others. And I'm okay with having a document saying these are good ideas to have and let the business to decide for themselves what they think is a good idea and what is a bad idea specific to their situation. And I'm almost thinking it's, I mean, I realize this, this, I'm glad we don't have a movie theater in, in Northampton because I think most people like to watch a movie while eating popcorn. <laughs> and we just, and, and the movie theaters I do are, are making their money selling popcorn along the way, some of it. And um, in Amherst Cinema, you need to be vaccinated to get in, maybe yeah. boosted. Yes. Um, and I think they're limiting their seating. I don't know if they're not yeah. serving food. Are they serving yes. food? Yes. They are serving? Can. As I recall, yes. Mm. I've been checked and I've been eating popcorn, but the rules change, so. And I don't know if they check on boosters. But their seating is limited. Yes. As, as I understand it. Yeah. Well, to be perfectly honest, the last time I went, there were two people, me and with someone else, so. So I thought I'd take from the other document, if you wanna make it all in one, that when a mask order recommendation is in place, that uh, groups or pods are separated by six feet when possible. Is that the aspirational number? That's what's been consistently talked about, but I know a, um, you know, a, a weight person is not gonna be six feet while they're taking an order, <laughs> realistically. Any other um, content? Does everyone agree uh, that you want to put these documents together? I'm fine with that, except that we lose the the specific point about separating food and drink from the seating area in in auditorium style venues. So I put that under here with a mask order. Venues do not offer food and drink in the same space as order auditorium style seating. Okay. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Thanks. So we'll put these documents together. We'll call it best practices for. Just one more question. Uh, employee tests positive. What's the, what's the guidance there? Call the Department uh, of Health. 
and quarantine? Yeah, I guess I'm not even feeling like I need to say that. Meredith, do you think we need to say that? Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Um, I think that's, that's really out there. Okay. You know, I don't think it's that silly. But I think it, we should include it. That um, isn't that employees, fabulous. Em, em, well, I don't really want to go into the recommendations because that's a whole full of wax. But um, COVID positive employees are reported to the Department of Health. No, isn't that they're not. No. Well, no, if you do a test, if you do at home test and you test positive. I thought businesses were supposed to report. That was long ago. <laughs> we actually had to send out a, a memo to the businesses saying you have to do your own contact tracing now. It's just, it was, it was too much. We did that about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. Okay. So what is it you expect businesses to do? I mean, positive employees, and, and we push this information out all the time, positive employees stay home, you know, here's the isolation period. And every time the recommendations change, we push that information out to the businesses. And the state guidelines are the same as CDC guidelines? Mm -hmm. Right now, yes. Other thoughts? That we condense it to a one pager. We really want this to be on one page. Yep, yep, yep. Let's take draft off. <laughs> Is it no longer a draft? <laughs> well, you could put it as a, you could put it on the, in the margin section or you can put it on the line. Put draft before Northampton Department of Health. Is top. it a draft now or is it our document? So number four, social distancing should be consistent, um, capitalization and bold. Yep, we can do all that. Be nice if I could type. Otherwise I'm good with it. I'll get it on one page. All right, so our plan is to send this to food establishments and concert venues, and then to create um, forums for discussion groups. Um, and maybe Amy, Kay, Helene, you can help us figure out what the groupings should be. Happy to. Thank you. All right, any other? Questions or comments before um, we move to minutes? Amy, Amy K. Lane from Amy H. Um, I Amy might have H. some questions that um, might be helpful too, because we've been trying to keep track of questions when we're reaching out to businesses. So maybe we could kind of compare. I feel like we might be in touch. So okay. anytime, you know where to reach me. <laughs> All right, great. We need to vote on this, Joanne. 
I don't think so. These are recommendations. Um, they're not policy. Sure. Um, is everyone comfortable with that? Fine with that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Joanne? Um, yes. Sorry, if we're just moving on to minutes and we're done, do you mind if I leave the meeting? No. <laughs> no, I can't go? <laughs> you may go. Anybody okay. else have anything for Meredith before she leaves? Um, no. Any update on our fifth uh, member, Meredith? Yes, the mayor's office contacted me this week and um, asked me to look at a resume. And so I responded back to her. So. I think she might move forward with an interview and if all goes well, then, you know, um, ask council to vote on her. Thank you. Anything else for Meredith? Thank you so much, Meredith. Okay, thank you guys. See you later. Later. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. All right, um, on to minutes, January, tw uh, January 13th. Those are the minutes you saw briefly last time. And I'll say that I had difficulty knowing what to cut and what to leave in. Um, I, Kelly, Kelly, do you happen to have them up? I have them and I'm happy to share because oh. I've made my edits on it. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen. And I can give this to you, Kelly. Okay. And I just do this in the, with the intent of, I send them, but I'm happy to go over what I, what I did. And unless I, it's just in the interest of time, I, I can do this. I just need to uh, start my word. <laughs> okay. <sighs> and I need to figure out how to share. Can you see it? Yes. yes. It's small though. I can zoom. How is this now? Better. Great, thank you. And if anybody else has comments um, to add as we go. Okay. Please chime in. Um, okay, January 13th. This was the first meeting after that December 28th meeting. Yes. Okay. And I'm happy to take notes. So here I just put, uh, and wanted to clarify whether that's correct or not. The state is reporting our positivity rates in Northampton at 8.3%. And I wanted to add something. It's 8.3% of what? I don't know, Viv Vivian, are you still here? I believe that they do include proctored rapid tests, which there are, probably aren't that many, uh, but I don't think it, they are all molecular tests. No, Vivian left. Okay. Um, so I don't think that that's correct. Okay. I had uh, our test positivity rate. I just put test up front of there. It, at least that gives some, some anchor to it. Yeah. Yeah. So a positivity rate, my understanding, as I understand it, means number of positives over the total number of tests. Yeah. So whatever tests that have been done that are officially through, and, and they get their data, I believe, through the state data. So whatever is reported to the state. No, I, I, I agree with this. It's just that as it was phrased, it, would, it could suggest that it was 8.3% of the Northampton population. That's why. Okay. But if, once we have tests, I'm good with this. Okay. Okay. Um, here, I just remove held because it was there a second time. Yep. Uh, you didn't put hands. a plural to hand. I, I, and then I, Warren, go I ahead. Think all who raised their hands. With okay. a D, unraised. Yeah. You pick up. Um, um, and then. I changed, took the liberty to speak on behalf. I just said, said that. Thank you. That day, so I just, I think I just try to simplify. Okay. 
Um, I don't think it was frequently. I just removed that. Don't remember what, why. Mm -hmm. May and okay. should became May. Mm -hmm. Fine, that just streamlines it a bit. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I guess normally we don't include so much detail in our minutes, but I guess because of the nature of the previous meeting that I thought that, that anyone who was interested in our minutes, that that would be appropriate to keep in our minutes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, here was just worth smithing. There was 20, summer of 2021. Um, yes. <laughs> so it's just, it, there's nothing much beyond just adding oh. a few words here and, there and making <laughs> clear that disease is COVID related disease. Uh, mm -hmm. Could we please say at the beginning, first sentence of this paragraph, Dr. Levin opened up the discussion of a, of a possible vaccine requirement? Good pickup. And it was specifically for restaurant bars and gyms, as I recall, it wasn't a global. That's true. Are we all good with this? Mm -hmm. Okay, next page. Um, again, just worth smithing. Um, I decided that Dr. Smith believed rather than felt. <laughs> um, down under this, right, that you picked that up, would not, would not screen out an asymptomatic. Oh, there we go. That was an important <laughs> difference. Mm -hmm. So Suzanne, does this paragraph adequately reflect your comments? That those are the changes that I have. I the only thing, uh, yeah, um, Laurent, I it, the comments I had the Laurent captured except for that one. Okay. What about the next paragraph? <sighs> Um, yeah, I didn't actually have any changes in that paragraph. Okay. Okay. Um, I took the liberty of changing what I said. Well, just okay. reframing. I didn't change what I said. <laughs> just. I'm, 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 I'm glad. I'm glad you made a couple of those changes. Okay. Okay, that's a good change for the senior center. Good. Uh, and that was it. Okay, anyone have any other um, additions or deletions or comments about these minutes? Would someone like to make a motion? Uh, move to approve the minutes as amended. Second. No. Any other discussion? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. And um, Lauren, you'll um, email those to Kelly? Yes, Kelly, I will email right after the meeting. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, and minutes from the 20th, which was our last meeting, I believe. Um, Can you see the new minutes or no? Not yet. No, not the new ones. Okay, let me stop sharing and share again. How about now? Yes. Yes. So, okay. um, yeah, that's good. We can't see uh, the whole page though. You can see the side? Uh, it's just, we see like half a page or less than I, half a page. I can see it just moving the, scrolling the, the video tiles up. So, 
So can you see the letter B from BOH? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, here are, I just removed one instance of that domain be, was being oh. recorded. <laughs> okay, good pickup. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know what the stars were, so I just deleted them, but. Um, it seemed to me that, that the one asterisk was missing oh. after confirmed or confirmed it, confirmed pop. The, 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 the terms are defined below. And I think mm. the asterisk was to, to follow confirmed. And then there's a definition of confirmed below. And then there are, um, I don't know. Hospitalizations and are in two stars, yeah. Right. Oh, that makes sense. So where's the first star? After confirmed, I think is the best. Or confirmed and probable, maybe. Confirmed and prob probable cases. Oh, oh. so it'd be like mm -hmm. this. That, yeah. that's, that's fine. And, and then yeah. after the word confirmed, the star should be after or before. Oh, no, or before. That's good. That's good. And what about using good old footnotes? I, <laughs> or, 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 or a new, a new line, perhaps. I think it, that's awkward. For definitions. Right. And then, and then there needs to be another new line after, oh, okay, you got it. How, they need to be lined up, however, those two could go. Uh, let me see. Will they lined up? If I was to look at the simple markup, yes, they will line up. So we'd have to remove simply the B and C, and I can do this later. Okay. 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 Um, I I think that um, I I think it would be clearer if B well confirmed cases are cases that have laboratory molecular PCR test period. Um, the these are not case the confirmed cases do not include cases who only have positive antigen tests. I I think that that is makes it less clear. I would eliminate that sentence and then the next sentence bleeds. Probable cases only have positive antigen tests. Oh, okay. So you're thinking this goes away completely. I think it makes it clearer. Yep. I, I, I remember struggling. Okay. I would ask um, Vivian to review that and make sure that it's right. Okay. And I would add after positive antigen tests without PCR testing. Okay, so should I just put a note here and say, Vivian to review language? Sure. So, Kelly, I, would so you can, I, to can I just say something? So yeah. I took those two definitions directly from her slide from her PowerPoint. Okay if that helps. <laughs> well, since we made an edit, it might just be good to. So we'll see if Vivian still agrees with these definitions. OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next paragraph. Very small edit. Um, there are a couple. The Go ahead. Fourth line, however, she, there are two she's um, that are being referenced here. One is Dr. Levin and one is Director O'Leary. So, oh, which so she? That was me. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and under the, the next sentence with Director O'Leary um, makes policies. I think it's unless the director is given emergency powers. Or you could say Director O'Leary indicated that without emergency powers. Without, perfect. She can make strong recommendations. I actually think she can do more than that, but. I think that's what she said, Joanne. <laughs> that, yeah, I think that is what she said. Does anyone remember when that emergency order was stopped and we, we stopped giving her power? I thought it was June. I think it was the, yeah, the summer. It was like Memorial Day, right around there. Yeah, I think it was right, right. So that's close enough, around June. <laughs> I have a problem with that emergency power because it reads, with that emergency power, she can make strong recommendation and the board makes policies. Um. <laughs> I think she was saying that she can make strong recommendations to you folks, and then you guys make the policies that are put in place. So is it she can only make? Well, I don't know if that's true. Or I'd say she can make wrong recommendations, period. The board makes policies. I don't know. We should be careful about what we're doing here. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, this is documenting something that happened, and now we're Think it, I mean, I, I don't know. I sort of have a different feeling um, about how minutes should be done or corrected. Well, um, I mean, if you if you're not comfortable, take that out. But I I think that it that it's not necessarily true that she cannot make policies. She can make policies under emergency recommendations. I mean, if we, if we don't want to put that here. I, I agree that she, her statement was that she can make strong recommendations and the board makes policies. Maybe the emergency um, powers is just muddying the waters. We don't have to have this much detail in our minutes. We do not, we do not. And, and in the past, we were trying to have less detail in our minutes. So should we shed all on this language or do we want to? I, I, I withdraw my suggestion. Okay. Um, anything else on that first page? Um, under review of mask mandate, I, I do not understand what Director O'Leary indicated that the data is telling. <laughs> That's an expression. <laughs> Um, about compelling? I think she those may, are the words she, she used, actually. She may, she may have said telling, but I think taken <laughs> out of context, it, um, I'm, I might, maybe I'm being too picky. Can we, we could say, just say she indicated. Speak for it, speaks for itself. Okay. Or you could just say she recommends we continue the mask mandate, period. Yes. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Right. At this time. Mm -hmm. Great. Did she say at this time? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay. okay. Wait, where are we? Um, can you just go back up a little bit to the beginning of that? Yeah.
Um, in that middle there where you have the word should, is that sentence complete? No, no, I'm missing something. I was realizing this. Should then be? it should be the board's recommendation. I don't know. This whole thing is too much, too much detail, I think. Um, Dr. Smith indicated that since it is being done voluntarily already. Uh, it just means it, it, that's not not important. It was it's just that I was I believe I said that any any mandate that we implemented was for those who are not already um, doing it voluntarily. But I think that's a given. Okay, so if it should, it's are you okay with this sentence? I, I would take the sentence out completely. You can take it all out. Yeah. You don't want to be quoted anymore. No, I just think it, it's it's redundant. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the issue it seems to be an answer to the question asked by Dr. Levin. Should we do something? Well. Some people are doing, Dr. Smith goes, some people are doing something, so we should recommend it to those who are not doing anything. We can actually simplify I, I, that I, sentence. Um, yeah, sentence I don't, before. I don't think, the, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead. I, just, I was just gonna say the sentence before, Dr. Levin asked the board if they wanted to make a recommendation as opposed to a regulation, instead of wanting to do something. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think, Never mind. I, I like it eliminating that Dr. Smith sentence. Okay. I, I don't think it adds anything. Okay. Then um, check my grammar here. Should it that's, be that's the venue yeah. not separate as opposed to does not separate proposed? Oh, no, no, it's if there's an if proposition. Side, side. Okay, that's that, that's much better, Lauren. I think that we're taking some sort of M cast of GRE. <laughs> it's the All verbal right. part. <laughs> All right, next paragraph. Um. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Are we good? Okay, with me. Mm -hmm. Someone like to make a motion? Um, motion to approve the minutes as edited, uh, pending. Vivian, being okay with this language that we proposed. Second. Any other discussion about these minutes? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. That is the end of our agenda. Uh, is there anything else anyone would like to bring up? Just to clarify our next meeting. Yes, our next meeting is on um, 17th. the 17th at 5.30. Uh, there, there is a chance that I might be a little late to that meeting. I'll let you know ahead of time, Joanne. Okay, a three is a quorum. So um, we could set the meeting later if you like. No, 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 please please start and uh, I'll join you when I can. I. I I think I'll be able to, but there's a chance I might be a little bit late. Don't wait for me. 
Okay. And um, I'll say I don't have a lot of, besides sort of bringing follow-ups on the letter that was sent or, you know, these best practices going out in a forum of uh, plans for forums and things like that, I don't think I ha would have any big new business. Um, is there anything else you think we should be addressing? I'm just wondering if I um, pulled together some samples of minutes that are taken. I, do we really want to go down this the route of all the this detail? I know we've had this discussion before, but it it really does take up a tremendous amount of our time. Um, and so, you know, there's many templates out there where you have a discussion and then the decision that was made after the discussion. I mean, if we find value in it, fine, but uh, it's, it's kind of frustrating <laughs> to go through this, to spend that much time on the minutes. So Kelly transcribes uh, from the tapes to the minutes. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, I suspect you're finding it almost easier to transcribe what was said than to sort of reformulate it. And maybe it's more my job to sort of reformulate it and condense it. Um, Kelly, you have thoughts about that? I try to capture what is important to, to what each of you say during the discussion. And sometimes it does get a little wordy. Yeah, so I think, um, Cynthia, I'll take the, the hit on that, that I could condense it more than I do. It's sort of hard to eliminate things when it's sort of written out already, but I will do my, de my best to condense more. But if, if the group doesn't want that, you know, it's a style, it's really a, a style of minutes. So I know Suzanne, you've expressed in the past, you like the detail, so. Oh, uh, well, everything's relative. I, I guess I, <laughs> I don't know what our requirements are for, yeah. for the public record. That, that's a concern that I have. Uh, I think the most recent minutes ha have been more complicated because the discussion has been more complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I don't think they're usually this detailed and such and such said this and such and such said that. I, I think since the requirement to record um, is now in all, all meetings with the city that, that those, you know, that detail is definitely there. And I'm wondering if there's a different move we make with the written minutes. So, um, Cynthia, I would not mind whatsoever having simpler min minutes. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry if I misspoke in that way previously. No, 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 you, you, know, you didn't misspeak. I, I think Lawrence actually likes doing this, so I, I want to hear from him. <laughs> gets, to practice, gets to practice his, uh, his grammar, right? <laughs> I, and we're a I, bunch of grammar I don't mind it. here. Um, I, yes. I do this all day, frankly, so it doesn't bother. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, it's just it's just a recommendation. But um. great. Well, thank you for bringing that up again. Um, any other thoughts, comments? Thank you, team. I love working with you. Back at you. Appreciate all your work. Thanks, Chief. All right. We'll thank see you in a few weeks. We, thank we, you. We, 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 <laughs> Would someone like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes.